and so I just got right at so five. Hello, Kambizjan. I, I know you're mute, but I want to say hello to you. <laughs> hello, this is Rana. Oh, hi, Rana. Hi. <laughs> 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 oh. oh, I see Kambiz. All right. Nice to see you, Rana. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Okay, um, well, it's 2.05, so I'm gonna go ahead and start again. Thank you for everyone being with us. It's, it's, it's wonderful to have you. Uh, it, it's becoming actually, uh, the weeks are going by pa passing us by fast, but I really, I look forward to this moment. I, I think it's more of an emotional attachment now. It's, it's, uh, it's nice to, uh, to have this connection, unfortunately, with everything we are going through, it, it, it is nice to have this. I know some of you, obviously, overseas, you're, you're back east and Midwest, so I didn't get a chance, I didn't have a chance to talk to you as much as I'm doing now. So this has been a wonderful tool to get connected with you. And uh, people around here, well, I'm used to seeing you in person, but at least we have the, our weekly connection. and. Uh, I'm grateful for that. Uh, so we have been on this journey. It's been a pretty uh, volatile and it's a roller coaster journey. And uh, as I had mentioned before, my whole objective, my mission is to give you this, um, the tools that making you independent, giving you the, the, the the understanding of what is your mission, why even we want to invest, and how we can maximize our uh, rewards in the markets, especially these volatile markets. And if you can do well in these markets, you can do well in many other markets, so or any other cycles. So uh, today, following up what we've done in the past, uh, what I like to start with, give you the, the, the guidelines, uh, what I'm going to do, and then after that, then we will open for questions, and I'll share some other stuff. Uh, last week, if you recall, we, we started with the derivative markets, which was a futures market, and uh, this week, I thought we'd continue on that, a different type of a derivative market, which is going to be the options, just give you a little introduction what they are. Um, again, because of the respect to time, it's very difficult uh, to squeeze everything. That's why we set up courses so we can go in details through them. But these are just introduction. At least you will feel confident and comfortable to approach them or when you hear in the news to understand what's going on because these markets have given us a lot of different opportunities to take advantage of. Uh, last week, we started with the commodity of the week uh, uh, scenarios, and last week was black gold. I wore a yellow shirt last week because I didn't want to wear black. So that was black gold. This week, we're going to talk about the real gold, and it's a yellow gold. So that would be um, a little journey toward to um, what is gold and how we can invest in that. Then we go to our, our weekly market analysis to see what happened last week what we are looking forward to next week and actually the months to come. Um, we are gonna, we've added the financial term of the week. Uh, every week I like to introduce you to one thing that hopefully it helps you in your analysis of the markets, the stocks or any type of, of investment vehicle. The same thing with the technical tool of the week. So you will understand um, the markets better and also gives you a little edge in uh, timing your entrance to the markets, getting out of it. And uh, so that would be uh, one. And the last one is, as usual, we can have the website of the week. With that in mind, let's talk about what is an option. If you recall, last week we talked about futures, and futures options are called derivatives. What that means, they really by themselves, they do not have any value. They, they drive from something else. So you do have, you've heard of swaps probably, and uh, they call them the CDOs, but the main ones are the futures, there's warrants, there's rights, but the futures and options are the biggest derivatives from the individual. And on a commercial institutional 
the swaps play, play huge, but it's very difficult for us to get in, involved with those. So options allow you to really take advantage of the, the market's volatilities, but also allows you to take advantage of the, the, the markets without really uh, be uh, dependent on the direction. So what is an option? In general, it is a right to buy or sell something, in this case, a property that is granted in exchange for an agreed upon sum. Now, if the right is not exercised at a specific period, the option expires and the person who bought it forfeits the money or the, the good faith money that he put for that and he can forfeits it. Now, the option and the reason that it's advantageous to us, it can be used on stocks, the futures, which is the commodities, the currencies, the financial instruments, such as the bond markets or stock markets or international stock markets. You can also use them in ETFs and stock indexes. So again, it is a form of derivatives. But let's say you have never had any encounter with option. So basically this might help to understand really what it means. Let's assume uh, you are, as a buyer, you see this beautiful house. It's the house that you always you have driven by it and didn't say, oh man, I'd love to have that house. And you go to the seller and you say, listen, I like that house. And she, she says that, oh, it's $500,000. At this time, you really don't have the liquidity. You haven't talked to the, uh, your financial company and you don't know if you're going to be able to come up with it in the next 30 days or 10 days or two weeks. So what you do as a buyer, you say, listen, would you mind hold that, that house for me? It's almost like layaway if you go to the department store and say, I will give you a good faith deposit. Let's say I give you $10,000. Can you hold on to this for 90 days till I get my finances in order? And please don't sell it to anyone else. So now what we have, we have an agreed price, which is that 500,000. And in option language is the exercise price. So that's what we are aiming at. We, we, are, we think that 500,000 is a good price. But the seller is not going to lose the opportunity because she can come back and say, listen, I have other customers. Why should I give it to you for 500000 while somebody else could buy it right now? So that's where you give that good faith payment. We call it the premium in options market of $10,000. So now she has that $10,000 and she knows that if you don't come back with the money, then she's going to keep that money. And in this case, we said like 90 days. So the time is for 90 days, I have the right to come back and buy that house for $500,000, which was agreed upon. Now, there's three things could happen in the meantime for the next 90 days. Now, the house prices could go to the roof. They can jump and for some reason the neighbor came, there was a, built this beautiful house, this, the value of the house just jumped to let's say six hundred thousand dollars because we have this contract agreement and i've given the seller ten thousand dollars she's obligated in 90 days to give me that house for five hundred thousand dollars i only gave her ten thousand so what am i going to do i could either move into the house or i can say oh man this is a great deal i will buy that 500 and then immediately sell it for six hundred thousand so Basically, my profit will be 600 minus 500, which is 100. But remember, I had already given $10,000 to the seller. So really, I made $90,000 in 90 days, which is, that's wonderful. The second scenario will be, if the, what if the prices really went down? And this time, uh, it was like a, a developer came and was trying to do something, and then they found out there was something in the, uh, the, the switch or whatever it was and then the property is damaged and it's like goes down to 400,000. Now in this scenario I really just gave them as a buyer gave that $10,000 and I can walk away in 90 days because I said thank god I didn't buy that house because that would have lost 100,000. So is 100,000 better or 10,000? So 
I can say, well, that's the ten thousand dollars, and that's what you can uh, you can have it. I'm glad because I would have lost hundred thousand. The third scenario will be the house doesn't move, so it stays the same at five hundred thousand, and at that time, I can either buy the house, or I can maybe I didn't get the finances, or I didn't have the money, or maybe I rethought and said, well, I have better bargain somewhere else. I can either walk away, then she will keep at $10,000, or I can come back and buy it. So these are the three scenarios, and that's what options do. Basically, options give you that leverage. Imagine here with $10,000, I was controlling $500,000. So I really didn't have anything with the house. It was just a good fate with the predetermined contract elements, which was the agreed price, the time, and how much premium or how much good faith payment I had to make. That's options in a nutshell. Now, you can apply this to commodities, you can apply this to Apple stocks, you can apply, it. and then you will have so many different strategies to use this and take advantage of it. But this is bare bone, in a layman's term, what options do. So why do we use options? Well, there's four major reasons. I mean, most people, when you talk to options, why they buy options is more of like number three, which is that being speculated because they think, well, um, if you notice, we put 10,000 to get a $500,000 property here to say, oh my God, you know, uh, Amazon earning is coming or so and so is coming and I'm going to put 10 cents and make it a dollar. I'm going to make millions on this. So it's a lot of time is speculation. And that's what the speculation is the same we just talked about. You know, you put a little deposit and you think you're going to make a lot of money because if the price went, went, went from 500 to 600, you made 100,000. You only gave 10,000. So you really, your money went up 10 times. And that's what the attraction for a lot of, especially retail investor, is that leverage it has. But that's not the main reason for options. The main reason as a portfolio manager, as a hedge fund, is basically to hedge a portfolio. Because again, you know, last six weeks, a good, good indication of what could happen to the markets. So a good time is to ensure when things are good. So that's why you buy homeowner's insurance. That's why you buy car insurance. You're, the reason you buy them is to protect what you have in the case of portfolios, either you have a lot of gains and you want to protect it, or you, at least you want to limit your losses. So if you have a car insurance every year, you're paying, that's your asset. Now, at the end of the year, you're praying you don't have anything happening to your, um, obviously your car or your home. So that premium is gone. You pay for it. It's the insurance you pay. But at the end of the day, you have the peace of mind knowing that if you had an accident, if there was a theft, or whatever happened, you do have the protection. And that's what the options do. They protect your portfolio. And the time to protect your portfolio is when things are good. So like January or December would have been a good time to buy options because you don't want to buy insurance after, let's say, the house is on fire or the car had an accident. Nobody will sell it to you. So that's why it's good to um, manage your if you're buying something, we will talk about strategies in the future. You know, you could, the things called like married put. So you can buy the put option to protect your gains, or you can sell sell calls to get some income and protect again your gains. The second part, and this comes into the third because I mentioned about the speculation, is the generated income. A lot of professionals. They don't want to speculate. They want to have options to use to actually have a steady weekly or monthly income, which is not dependent much on the markets. They make money if it goes up or they make money when the market doesn't move. So they still make money or the opposite. Then when the markets go down, they still make money. So the, bigger, more, the professionals, they don't look at uh, the 10 baggers or 100 baggers, as they call that means making 10 times their money. They look at steady income, and there's a lot of strategies you could use. The fourth one that you don't hear much is uh, you could actually use 
if you have limited investment account, it's a portfolio of let's say it's ten thousand dollars, and the ten thousand dollars you cannot have a diverse portfolio most of the time. Let's say you want to buy Amazon, and God, you can't even buy four of them. So you basically will have four, not even five. So four Amazon shares, that's it. How many Apples or Teslas can you buy? So what people do, the investors, you could actually have something called long-term equity anticipation or leaps that they go beyond 12 months. So because you don't know what's going to happen, but let's say you're kind of bullish. You think this pandemic is going to end by next year and you feel pretty confident in your assessment based on the history and you say well i don't have enough money but i love disney i like boeing i don't i like goldman sachs i like bank america but i want to have a diverse and diversified portfolio but with ten thousand dollars i cannot do much by using your um the leaps you could have let's say a year or two year options and these for the maybe a fifth of a price or a tenth of a price and you can hold it and this way you have instead of having maybe two holdings two different stocks you could maybe have 10 stocks and this way if economy moves up you move with it economy sensitive or if you have technology and it's not really depending on economy if you have gold related you can have your own little portfolio without really sacrificing the diversification Um, as always, uh, I like to go look at the options uh, history. Well, I, as I had mentioned before, I like history. So um, believe it or not, that the first reputed option by it was a, this was an ancient Greek uh, mathematician and a philosopher. It was Italius of Miletius. And what he did, remember in those ancient Greeks, obviously olives were very big part of the economy. So on a certain occasion, he, he, he predicted that, that really the olive harvest would be great, would be more than it, it was needed and usual. So what he did during the off season, he acquired the right to use a number of olive presses for the following spring. So when the following spring came and the olive harvest was, which he knew was larger than expected. Well, he exercised the option. He got those presses and then he rented the presses out for a much higher price because it was in demand and that paid for his option. So that's how the option started. All right. So let's talk about the commodity of the week. And as I mentioned, I gave you the hint. It's the, the, this has been in the story, it's been in the, in the news, the, the commodity of the week. It's going to be gold for this week. And, and I think it's timely. In the past, I've shown you how gold is in the times of panic, in the times of crisis, in the times of uh, uncertainty has played a role. And I thought it's timely to, to work on understanding what is gold. Uh, for what its advantages, what its uses. So, again, a little history. Believe it or not, but the, the piece of natural gold actually was discovered in Spanish caves and goes back to 40,000 BC. But it wasn't until uh, 3600 BC that gold was smelted down by the Egyptian goldsmiths. The Egyptians were part of some of the earliest gold conquests. And they were using the prisoners of war, slaves, the criminals to work the primitive gold mines on their time. And this took place during a time when gold had really no official, it was not known monetary value or significant. But it was sought after simply because of its high desirability as a commodity. It was something very unique, and you'll see why. One of the reasons is the, we went back, I mean, this is from the beginning of time, when we look at how much gold has been mined, has been the jewelries, if we added everything up, we will have 190,000, this is of end of 2017, so a little over 190,000 tons of gold. What that means is if I can put it in visually, this 190,000 will cover about two and a half football fields. 
that's all the gold in the world that we have. So you can see it's pretty finite. Now, majority of that has been used in jewelry, about 47.7%, and there's about 21% in private investments, in uh, official sectors, you know, some of the, uh, for the backings, it's been 17%, the other is about 14, and still below the ground is about 54,000 tons that assume that it, it's there. So it, again, it is a, a finite commodity, and as of, um, I calculated, as of like Friday's close, if you multiply these tons or the troy ounces, there's about nine and a half trillion dollars worth of gold around the world. So it is, again, pretty finite. But why even we have to consider gold? Well, there's three major reasons. One of them is store of wealth. It actually protects your purchasing power. Now, what I mean by that, if I go back, let's say even 5,000 years ago, gold still has similar value, inflation adjusted as what is today. It will buy similar things. I'm not looking at the short term cycles. I'm talking about a long term. It has kept its value. If I go back to 1800, if I had $1 of gold in 1800, that $1 gold will buy worth of $1 equivalence after inflation of what goods can be bought today. On the other hand, if I had $1 of a dollar, if somebody gave me a dollar coin, the value of that dollar would be one tenth thousand of it. That means that $1 has depreciated so much that I have to have $10,000 today to equal that $1. So that's why gold is important. And it is, you can, it's, it's pretty universal. You can take it everywhere and it's accepted everywhere. And that's what it is. Um, it is pretty much keeps its, its, its wealth. Again, if you go overseas, it's the same as here. It is also a diversifier because usually it has a low correlations with other assets, let's say. Uh, bonds or other financial assets. So it's kind of independence. And it's important when you're, um, uh, you want to structure your portfolio, you want to make sure you have different assets that they have local relations to each other. And it's also, it's a hedge, strategic hedge at challenging times. We, we looked at the history in 2008, for instance, and we've gone back, we looked at what has happened in times of crisis, gold becomes a go-to place. And you'll see why, why is that? One of the interesting things about gold, the properties it has it that not all the other precious metals have, including silver, is it's the, it also not only because of its beauty, it has a unique properties and it has a versatility. It is, it's, it, it conducts electricity, for instance. It's conducive. It's resistance to corrosion. That's, it's, it's hugely important that it, that it is no corrosion. It, it is malleable, it's ductile, it's catalytic, uh, catalytic properties, it's um, biocompatible, they use it in nanogold. So it is, it's very fine and besides being so beautiful. Now, where do we use the gold? The big major uses of golds are in jewelry, majority of time. But more and more now, it's actually in finances. Gold was the standard and still is in some of the currencies, the backing of that currencies. As you can see, we call them fiat because now look how easily we can print money. But you cannot print gold. You have to mine them and you have to. Uh, it's a real thing. So because of that, it's the one which, which backed the major currencies. And in 1971, President Nixon decided to uh, get away from the gold as a standard and you had the free float dollar and other currencies. So that was, that's when the things happened. The gold was fixed at 32 or $33 to a dollar. And after that, it that's the reason we have we cannot print anything because we don't have to worry because it's the good fate, fate of the US government, for instance. 
Um, it's used in dentistry, in medicine, in electronics, in mobile phones, in laptop computers, for medals and stats, statues. So it is used some in food, cosmetics, some creams they use that, buildings. I mean, if you go see the cathedrals, the mosques, there's a lot of beautiful, you know, you go to the Michi times and the Florence, you see so many buildings have used that. So it has uh, many uses. But what drives the gold market? One of the most important things, and you will hear this a lot with the commodities, is the dollar. Again, the dollar is the standard um, right now, obviously, as we speak, is the standard currency. Um, it doesn't mean fundamentally is the strongest, it's just the, the least bad of everything else. So the other currencies are just uh, in much worse shape than the dollar is. So, and also we mentioned last, uh, last week about petrodollar, a lot of loans, emerging market, the government loans, a lot of the dollars, most of the time is exchanged in uh, uh, the, the oil, the commodities are exchanged in dollar. So that's why it's a standard currency. So when the dollar goes up, and you need more money to buy the, the gold, so the gold depreciates. When the dollar depreciates, usually that means you can have, um, you have to pay more for that gold. Most of them it happens, but there are times in the times of crisis that you will see that it is possible to have gold going up and the, the, the price of dollar going up because they are a place of safety. Inflation, because as I mentioned, gold is the store of value. It keeps its value then for inflation. And there is um, an economical backdrop. So the, there's a, the, with the prices uh, going up, then the gold keeps its value. And that's what is a hedge against inflation. In geopolitical risks and other risks that we can see now, the gold becomes the safety haven. And that's what, because again, because it keeps its value, it's mobile. I can take my gold, not the big bars, but let's say I have coins and it still keeps its value. If I went to South America, the gold would be similar price than I went to New Zealand or Australia or went to China. Because of that, and that means there's risk, it has the place, it is the place to go. Also, the central banks can drive the price of gold whether they purchase it or they sell it because they're the biggest purchasers. I mean, the Indian Central Bank, well, when, uh, when Modi came and it, it he, um, put bans on import of gold, obviously the price of gold went down, but like India Central Bank, China Central Banks are some of the largest purchasers, Russia, Turkey, the, the largest holding in the world is in the United States. So United States has the largest uh, holding up as a central bank. But even ETFs, exchange traded funds like GLD, physically holds gold as a backup. It's not futures that they hold, they really, so they actually store the gold. So that's why they are the big purchasers. And as they, the fund has grown, they have bought more. There's a Canadian, there's a, a closed end fund called CEF. And this closed end fund, for instance, buys both platinum, silver, and gold. So these funds, they actually buy these uh, metals uh, physically, so they can um, drive the markets. You have to remember, you know, we talked about supply and demand. So basically what happens when there's supply is higher, obviously the prices go down. When there's a demand higher, with let's say ETFs and the times of crisis, the, the price goes up. Interest rates also drive the price of gold, especially around the world when you see the negative yields going around from Europe to Japan. And uh, there's, I don't know if it will happen in the United States, but it is something that uh, to consider when there's a negative yield, there's two things. Number one, you have to pay uh, to store the gold. So now when there's that negative yield, so you don't have that competitive force. If you can get 10% in the bank or 5%, well, I'm gonna go buy CD or 
But if there's not really any yields out there, there's volatility in the stock market, then gold becomes an attractive, uh, attractive uh, alternative. And that's another reason this, uh, this negative yields. Um, the last is the supply and demand factors. And now I mentioned about India. India is uh, responsible about, I think, about 22% of consumption of gold. Because still to this day, it is, uh, it is valued as, um, as a high commodity. M most of the Indians, especially in the rural area, they don't have a bank accounts, but the jewelry plays a huge role. I mentioned here monsoons. Monsoons are a good indicator of what happens to the gold price. And the reason for being is when there are monsoon season, it's very good, the sugar production goes up. And the sugar production, when it goes up, then the wealth goes up in those rural areas. And they, what do they do? They buy gold jewelry. Obviously, the Diwali, which is the, the New Year, the celebration in, in Indian culture, that's a big thing because people give gold gifts. The weddings, gold plays a big role. Like about November or so, I think Diwali is usually, but usually it's like in October. The wedding season starts like November 6th or so. That, that's when the, the gold becomes more in demand. So after September, you'll see there's a movement in gold. You have Chinese New Year. So in China, also gold has a lot of value. You go to Middle East, you see, I mean, Dubai, for instance, is the center of some of the largest gold production. You go to Turkey, you go to Iran. So that's, that's the, what drives the gold market. One thing about the, I mentioned the, the, the risk, geopolitical risk, on the other hand, if you recall, a few years ago, about 2010, 2011, we had the pigs. We had the, um, you know, the Italy, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, and mainly Greece were responsible for the devaluation of euro, what happened with the European economy. At that time, you would think what happens is because there's a crisis, the gold price has to go up. But the actually gold topped in April of right around April, July time, silver topped on uh, April 24th, but uh, gold did about uh, July, I think, at 1940s or so. And um, you would think, okay, there's a crisis, the price should keep up. But at that time, the central banks of Spain and Portugal and other countries, they were just, they had to uh, liquidate their holdings because they were in such a dire situation. So sometimes even though there's these political risks, that supply and demand, I have to get liquidity as soon as possible. So at that time, I don't, I don't care. I want to sell at any price. Okay. So how do we invest in gold? Well, there's a few ways. Last week I mentioned about oil. The same thing applies to gold and a little more. I mean, you, you, you will see what is the difference. Obviously, both markets is the futures market you could use. You could use leverage and it's very short term, long term. You can use it as a, we mentioned last time that with the futures market you have the, as a hedgers, the commercial usage, and then you have like the speculators, the small and large uh, retailers. Um, commercial users. So you could use, and the, the symbol or the, the root is GC if you want to use futures. The easiest way would be ETFs, exchange traded funds or exchange traded notes. And I give you some examples here. You have uh, GLD, IAU, SGOL, there's many more, but these are the biggest ones. Um, or you don't want to hold by the actual gold. You think well, the minings, because of the price of gold is going up, maybe the miners are gonna do more because now they're producing more, they can sell it at a higher price, but their inventory is there. So you can buy ETFs of this. The best ones are GDX, GDXJ, which is a junior mining. So it's a smaller, uh, smaller mining companies, which is mainly these are in Canada, United States, South Africa, Australia, uh, there's Chile, uh, Peru, Russia, um, we go to Kazakhstan. So they are um, 
these are the miners, so you could actually use that. And of course, South Africa being one of the largest in the world. So then you have ring, you have nugget, which is the um, leveraged uh, miners. Uh, you can buy mutual funds. You can go to Fidelity, Vanguard, the Spross, US funds is one of the largest ones. So you can have gold funds, invest $1,000, you can, they will buy diversified actually holdings of the mining companies, for instance. I mentioned there's a difference between oil and uh, gold. I mean, you don't want to go buy a barrel of oil and hold it in your house. First of all, oil is pretty toxic. And that's one of the reasons you've had this problem with the storage. You know, you don't have problems with storage of wheat. I mean, it just goes to waste. Okay, you lose that. But with oil, you really have to find a place because it's really toxic. With gold, you don't have to worry about it. You can store it for thousands of years. So that's why you can even buy bars and store it. Uh, four of the top places to store your um, bars at a small price. Some of the largest places are Singapore, London, Switzerland, and New York. Uh, lesser degree, Hong Kong, Utah, probably Utah, uh, Utah you can also, there, you can store it there. Uh, but the main places you can actually don't even have to see it. You just call, let's say in Switzerland, you say, oh, I want $100,000 in, in Swiss bars or gold bullions, and then they just store it for you. And just you pay storage to every month, or you can arrange it every year. So that's another way. Other ones is they're true coins and collectibles. And that could be, if you're a collect, you know, the, the value is not the same as bars because it, it's also because it's collectible. The purity of these coins are important. It could be MS65, which is the, the highest, MS64, 63. So the higher the purity, the better the price. And then uh, we have the Krugerrand, which is the South African, Canadian maple leaf, American eagle, uh, Australian kangaroo, we have Chinese panda, pandas. Um, and these are, you know, they come at a premium you have to pay. So when there is a price of gold is going up, just be careful. Don't jump on either bars or Krugerrand -and because you not only have to pay for the price of gold, the dealers, they know there's a demand. So for instance, right now I hear the bars are going for $100 a premium. So let's say gold is 1,700. These dealers are selling them for 1,800. The average price should be about 25 to $40. So you really, they are taking that spread pretty high. The last but not least, let's say you have limited amount of money and you say, well, I really like investing in stocks. So you have new mining, American barracks, uh, Frank Nevada, we have the Wheaton, we have the Canarsa, which is a Canadian company, and Real Gold. So basically, this is another option, investing in using stocks to invest in gold. Okay. All right. The, the markets. What happened last week? I mean, we've had the first three days were fantastic. April was ending as... Uh, the best month, depending on what index you use, um, from, from Russell 2000 going back to 1974, you look at S&P uh, going back to 1987, we look at uh, NASDAQ going all the way back to 2000 and then 2008 and nine. So it, 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 it's amazing that it was supposed to be the best month and then the last two days happened. Let's see what happens. So what I like to start with, first of all, I always like to look at the economy. And the reason I like to do this because I think there is a separation right now going on. We call it the Main Street and Wall Street. And I like to see what is the average person as a human being feeling and what is the markets doing. And so we'll start with look at the economy. Well, one of the biggest news was obviously last week, last Monday, you know, Georgia started opening. So there has been some partial reopening, whether rightly or wrongly, people they feel that it, it's time to start doing something and they just feel that it, it, they are in prison. So if you notice these blue, and there's I think 18 of them, they they open their doors as a partial reopening phase one and see what happens. 
Um, Georgia was the first one, but Texas, Oklahoma. And then the yellow ones are the orders lifting or reopening soon. It could be May 15th, some of them are May 8th. And the orange ones are the ones that are still shut down. And we are in California, some of you in Maryland, some of you in Illinois. They still haven't, there's still restrictions, although, you know, limited number of uh, places are opening just for the takeout food. I still haven't had a haircut. It's like, I don't know what to do, but hey, I keep calling my dresser to see what's going on, but they're not open. So. so I have a list of, you know, those 18 states, seven opening soon, but the 26 states not open. The interesting thing is um, whether this is by choice or this is political, I can guarantee you one thing. If this was this thing happened in 2021, the reactions of the, all these states and the government would not ha would have, have been the same as it is today. And this is not right or left, this is an election year. And I've mentioned it in December, January. It, it, to begin with, it's a volatile year, anytime the fourth year of presidency. And I think things are, the decisions are being made that it has, again, if it was a year after or two years before, it, it, it wouldn't have, it would have been different decisions, but this is what it is. So that's where we are now. One of the problems I run into, if you notice the shutdown, the restricted places, they include California, they include Illinois, they include New York, Washington, D.C., Massachusetts, Boston. So some of the largest cities, which is really heart of the economy, they still close. And I, I, I think it's okay. I, personally, I don't mind to have a little more closure in the sense that uh, feeling a little more confident because the second wave, when it comes, if it ever happened, which I, I hope it will not, it, it, it will be devastating. So I'd rather have a little cautiousness. And uh, so, Shem, okay. would you mind if you uh, make sure everything is, everyone is needed, thank you. Uh, now, you know, I, I, I of all the channels, I have Bloomberg on, I put it on mute. I just like to see while I'm working. I don't listen to any other, I don't watch anything. I don't watch Netflix or really just Bloomberg. I just like the, uh, the way it's presented. But other than that, I don't really care about the news because Wall Street tells us something and I know there are discounting factors and I know they're looking at beyond quarter two and quarter three. I think last week on Wednesday we had the, the, uh, the when we had that big rush and for three days we had the we hit the highest it had been since March 23rd. It seemed like and I wrote a note, texted it's like the markets are taking the perfect scenario as if you're back where we were in December. So what I do and they do a lot of studies on first trust advisors, Department of Labor, they come up with this. And I, besides the initial jobless claims and the weekly retail sales that you can see is horrendous. I mean, we are going lower in, in a good way. I'm saying it's like the 6 million and, and 4.6 million, not 3.8 million. Last year was 230,000. Our weekly retail sales last year was 5.5. This is 8.1. And this is not even a complete picture. I mean, we have to see what happens a month from now when we look back or three weeks from now. This is what I look at. I look at the box office receipts are 8,791 compared to 151 million. Uh, the rail car traffic, the steel production. So everything you can see is basically in the big negatives. The hotels, the occupancy is 26%. The average daily rates are 73 compared to 128, but the revenue per room is $19. Um, the restaurant industry is completely shut down. Um, and then I also uh, always interested to see what is the TSA checkpoint data. 
119,000 compared to 2.2 million a year ago. So basically these are the things, the revenues for the state. And we still, these numbers are not 100% because we, we don't take all what has happened. The reason I showed you that is when in 1920, we had only 26% of our population working in the service sector. Today is about 86%. And the service sector is really responsible for the majority of GDP. We, we talked about it two weeks ago, and I mentioned about how the GDP is calculated, which is 70% on consumption, which is 45%, is really out of 70%, but 45% comes from the service economy. So if that's shut down, the difference between manufacturing and, and, and then services, with the manufacturing, I have inventory. I can Granted, I still have to pay rent, I have to pay other expenses, but I can bring those inventory and hopefully sell it in a month, two months when the things open. With service, we don't have that. We don't, I mean, if you don't go to a restaurant, that revenue is lost. There is no replacing that. If I don't go to the hotel, if I don't fly, if I don't go on a cruise line, if I don't go to Disneyland, these revenues are not coming back. Granted, we can look at a year from now, they will be there, but they're completely lost. And that's why it's very important to understand. And that's what I evaluate. What is the service side of our economy doing? Again, my hope is everything is going to be back for everybody's sake. Um, one positive thing I have to tell you, and I, I, I truly believe in that, is Americans, we as a society are a very optimistic and positive society. And that has kept us going. The main reason, and I have mentioned it and I keep repeating every time, is the history. We really have a short history. We don't have a lot of baggage. I mean, coming from a, a 3,000 year old civilization, my God, my country had been invaded so many times. You have so many conspiracy theories, you know, there's always we see, and it's not by choice because the stories, the history has been made for us that we see the negativity on things because we have been taken advantage of. I, you know, you cannot completely trust this. America doesn't have this. America has people who were the positive people. They looked for a bright future. They brought their children to have a bright future. So that's for me is the, the biggest and the, the most admirable things about American society, but also it could be Achilles heels in the sense that sometimes the reality is lost. But we, we, we are, we, we always uh, come back from the crisis and hopefully we'll continue and I'm sure we will. But that's one of the major reasons between our economy and other economies. I thought this was interesting also. It was the, 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 the year of the economic analysis. It came up with these numbers. Our consumer spending, I mean, you can see, I mean, it's just a month to month basis down over almost $1.1 trillion. We are not really spending. Uh, the wages are obviously lost. Unemployment benefits, tiny bit up there. But the personal savings are shooting up. I mean, you hear people are saving more. They're getting checks or benefits or whatever the loans they're not spending. They're not going out. So basically they're saving, which is a good news, but also that means that money is not coming back to the economy. So the hope is, and that's one of the reasons, again, some of these states open their economy because they want to make sure that money is going to flow in the the, the, the communities. Another interesting thing I, I, I saw was um, the small mom and pops are getting a lot of love from their communities. Why? Because people are not traveling. They want to stay within their community. They like to visit their local stores. And so that's maybe has become positive. So I don't get in the car and drive an, an hour from now to get a bargain, for instance. So that's, again, that's what our behavior has really changed. So let's talk about the markets the week we had. And um, um, I'm going to review um, 
again, the history I've, I've talked to you about, I go back, um, there's a question that is just a V-shape. And when I say V-shape, the markets drop and then they're gonna go up the same thing we, we had in December of 2018 with Chairman Powell. And, and I, I thought this is interesting to see what has happened in the past. Again, that doesn't mean 100% will repeat, but I just like to see within six months, um, when the, the, the intermediate peak was in, um, what happened to the market six months later? Um, we, we can start with the blue line, which was a down in 1937. You can see that's where it was. By in, in within six months, it still was down about 32%. In uh, 1929, when we had the peak, six months later, we still were down 30%. So we did drop over, up close to 50%. We had a nice bounce back and we just digested. We went down and still were down. Um, then Nikkei, this is a great story. I mean, 1980s, late 80s, the Japanese were buying everything. And then this whole deleveraging happened. And they still haven't gotten, I mean, they still have no inflation. They are, have negative yields and, still trying to create, get out of what they did in 1980. So this was Nikkei after six months. And then the S&P in 2008, you know, in March we, we, we bottomed out. So the reason I show this, this is where we are. So the S&P in 2020. As you know, we talked in uh, February 26th or somewhere around that time, we dropped March 28th, that was the fastest since 1929, 33 years, three, three days or so. We've had one of the fastest moves and this is where we are. And the question is, will we just maybe move a little bit and then go back up and everything will be good? Or will we go down at least, depending on the markets, whether we will even undercut the low of March 23rd. And this is where I will discuss that we are in a two different markets, the tail of two markets. And this is important to me because what happened with the 401ks, we, we did the emergence of the exchange traded funds. Of, if you recall from 2009, we had one of the biggest bull markets and this was the longest continuous uh, in the stock markets and which ended in, you know, really in, in, February, in the February of 2020. That's almost 11 years from March 9, 2009. What happened was a lot of this money, you really didn't have to choose the stocks. The markets were doing the work for you. So the passive investing was important. They exchange traded funds like S&P with uh, spiders. They were doing the 401ks were allocated to a lot of uh, baskets of investments and uh, the investments were again in indexes. So I believe today, and especially since we had the earnings last week and uh, last week, we've got two more weeks, which we'll discuss the earnings. This is the time to become stock picker. I think the days, it's my opinion, for the next few years, I don't believe the markets are going to over, um, uh, as far as overperform the, the, the individual stock or investment selection. And that's why it like kind of gives me the encouragement. I love to, I mean, I look forward our Saturdays because I'm hoping I can give you the tools to become your own analyst, to become your own researcher to find there are gems out there. So right now what we have, and I explain what happened to the markets, you have equality companies that they're still there and they will be there 10 years from now. And they're the companies that they were really oversold and bouncing with the markets right now for no reason. They, whether it's the Fed, pumping in $2.3 trillion, or there's the fiscal responsibility of the government, they're pumping this money. 
for whatever reason, there are some good quality companies, but not there are many that, that they shouldn't be in business. And it, it's tough to say that, that we are in an open market society and that's what we want our performance of investments to have some kind of a logic, even though I've learned my lessons that logic doesn't work in the markets most of the time. It's about liquidity. I mean, I mentioned last week, you know, it was the expansion of PE and buybacks really pushed the, the markets up because it was just so much liquidity with the companies. It wasn't really organic growth of the companies, but there are companies that they're going to grow. They're going to do well, a lot of technology companies. So to answer that question, whether this is a V-shape, it might be V-shape for a few companies, but I'm not sure three or four years down the road on S&P 500, there are going to be companies that they'll be gone, maybe hundred of them. I don't know. I mean, these are the thoughts that they, we are really, this is a transformational time, at least in my lifetime. Things are changing. I looked at the sectors for the year to date. And if you want to have a healthy, um, as far as economy, I look at the financials. I want to make sure financials are leading and we're still not there. We will look at that. Basic materials are the economic sensitive. They're the raw materials, they're the energy, the, the oil. I mean, the gold is also, and imagine if the gold was not, the miners were not, how bad this would have looked. Um, we look at the industrial goods. Industrial goods are economic sensitive, but then we look at caterpillars of the world. We could look at deers, we look at Boeing, there's the machinery. So, so far, these are the, like, the worst performing. So, although the markets are up, you know, we look at, you know, you say, wow, well, you know, uh, look at S&P, bounce back, uh, Russell 2000 had one of the best, but where are the, the segments or the sectors who are pushing it up? And that's important to me. When I see the healthcare leading, well, that's a defensive stocks and they better. I mean, that's, uh, we looked at the, previous um, crisis and healthcare was usually the number one or number two. Mm, technology, we are in a different world. I mean, they, they are kind of have their own stories and they're gonna be some companies emerging from this leading and going to all time high. Um, then we look at the consumer goods and the services. When we look at services, we, we, we're looking at Companies like Netflix, looking at for Disney's of the world, even Apple is a service. And you go look at consumer goods. I'm sorry, Apple is a consumer good. Apple, uh, anything that you use for your personal, uh, it could be food, it could be drinks, it could be toys, it could be sports, anything that is related and that Apple is part of that's consumer goods that you can spend money. <coughs> whether you need it, some of them are discretionary, but most of them are non-discretionary, you really have to have them. But this is where I wanna see this part moving. Utilities are in the middle because of uh, many reasons. They're more of a defensive, but um, they were telling us in the beginning, they were really overperforming the other sectors and you knew there's a defensiveness. So the markets knew something. <coughs> uh, the thing is, I show this because it's from Finvis. I really want to go and every weekend try to um, evaluate this and see um, what is um, what are the best sectors for the week, for the month. So it gives you a better understanding of what's going on. Um, this is a chart of the S&P 500. This is the cash the SPX. Um, I've, Hope you're a little familiar, more familiar with the Fibonacci numbers. And this is from the high to the low. I had mentioned the markets usually go and when they get to the 50%, usually that they want to rest. When they get to 61.8%, that's a huge number. And that's a decision number. I mean, these were drowned. Look at this is from February to March. So, but the markets respect their numbers. Last week, we hit on Wednesday, we hit the number at the 29.38, 29.40. We respected that, and that's what we had two days of sell off. I have this trend line, 
and this the market was uptrending since March and on Friday we broke down now we still this is called ambush zone so if you ask me what is my feeling about the markets right now I'm neutral I haven't gotten the the to the sell signals by shorting the markets I bought a lot of things right around here and I've been gradually selling so if there was anything I would have lightened up around here but as far as going short the markets I'm not shorting yet because I need confirmation normally at least to another bar on Monday and Tuesday and if you break below that 50% number then that will give me more confidence thinking that yes we can go back to 38 and eventually we'll see but there might be a little digestion here so that's again this is you will see a common uh, theme here because uh, now this is Russell 2000 which was the strongest for the last week last week and uh, in month of April had a great month you can see we went over 50 percent the ambush zone immediately the next day we reverted back and we are sitting right on the trend line as well as at 38.2 percent so again next week if you break this down and go then i will respect that that all this was it was just an oversold we call it technical bounce rather than fundamental believing in the stock market as a whole thinking that we are gonna revert and gonna go back to this all-time high this is the nasdaq the nq which has been the strongest now this is the the only index i think it might not come back and test this because of the the large cap growth technology companies historically when we go hit that 70.8 the 78 percent usually if you break down we will go to all-time high so it's very difficult the farther you are from the low of where we start this Fibonacci, the harder to come back. So uh, although we broke that trend line again, so this is negative, and I always look at the volume, you see the down volumes, and you see the blue ones are when it's up. The red lines is where the market went down. So you can see there's a distribution. Even when there were up days, they weren't as strong. Regardless of that, I see that we might have a little rest here. But if we break that down and it's like 61.8 then there's a room that you could go there might be a little digestion in this area and then the market is going to decide depending on what the news are if there's better news about vaccination if the more states are opening and it's under control your phase two phase three then we will see what happens but right now this is i'm on a neutral with this um this is a dow jones index of Jones 30 industrial again the same theme we went inside ambush zone which is a 61.8 and 50 we spent a few days and then we broke that trend line and i need confirmation again we had the higher volume vix is the volatility index the fear index and you can see as the march 23rd the the market started going up obviously the volatility started squeezing we still anything over 30 that means it's still high volatility so the markets are not convinced that we are out of woods but we did hit that 76.8 and 6.4 and then we, we bounced back now we'll see if this goes over the number approximately about 40 then we ended ambush zone so that means if this goes up usually the markets go down so you want to watch this you can even buy the vix i have mentioned again the most important uh sector for me is the financials and the financials are the ones that they guide us we still have a lot of unknowns and the markets are telling us that uh, they didn't even have enough power to get to that 50 percent and because of that, it just died down and we broke under 38. So this is not a good sign for the market. So, um, so I've been selling my whole, I bought uh, XLF at, on March 23rd and I've been just liquidating gradually. So 
um, just a food for thought. So XLF, you will watch. Um, the dollar, obviously, is very important because in the case of crisis and if the money goes to the dollar, we are in really a neutral zone. You can see we're just hanging around this area. So um, there is no confirmation yet. So that's also neutral. Dow Jones transportation, it follows again. It was a leading indicator telling us what the markets are about to sell off. This, this was given to us in January. They topped in January while other markets topped in February. And we've been going up, but again, we, are in, we didn't even hit it to 50%. And we turned around and come back down. So I will watch the, the, the transportation. The other thing is, on, on two Thursdays ago, you, if you recall, um, uh, Chairman Powell came and they started the two, two, $2.3 trillion buying municipal bond, but mainly the junk bonds and uh, the triple B, the liquid. So I thought this is where the announcement came. We hit that high. And since then, we've been gradually just going down. So we are in a very crucial point. So I watch the bonds, but especially the, junk, the high yield bonds to see what directions it's gonna give me. So if you break this down, there's a gap here. You're trying to fill that gap. That's not good news for, uh, for small companies. And especially again, there's a lot of energy companies. And uh, so I, in the past, I watched LQD, HYG. I just thought I'd show you this on just a respect of time. The other thing I do is I like the ratios. This is you can do with stock charts. All you do is choose anything. You can use with stocks. All you put the, the division sign in the middle. So I want to see S&P, how much is it worth using gold, not the US dollar? And you can see we were doing really good. We were much better than gold, you know, as a S&P using um, gold as a currency. And then we dropped on the March 23rd. So we've been going up, but now you can see again, we are in a crucial point uh, compared with gold. So we are turning down. We, are, we went over the 50-day moving average. So this week is important for confirmation. So again, I don't have the sell signal yet. But these are what I'm watching, and this is that's why I like you to have you know the copy of the slides because this is what you could do over the weekend. Um, believe me, once you get more familiar with this, it becomes addictive. I mean, it, it, it's it's fun. <laughs> I don't know how many of you I enjoy you know researching these, but you can actually develop your own story and find out the whys and why is this happening and in different levels. And this is the price of gold itself. Now gold, this is on a weekly, it's at 1700, it's consolidating. So while the stocks were going up last week and two weeks ago, and well, gold is just having a good time on top. So it could go down to 1614, but there's a big support, look at where we were. So this is something, um, you know, I will watch. I wouldn't jump on gold right now, but gradually, and maybe again, I think miners, the GDX, and GDXJ, they have more potential of moving. Uh, some of silver miners uh, in the past, I had mentioned PAAS, you know, P-A-A-S. I mean, it was like 11 or $12 not long ago. It went over 22. So there are companies right there that you can actually look at. Um, one thing I... I think you're gonna hear a lot more. So maybe next week I dive in more on Bitcoin. Um, as you know, this coming week or next week coming up, it's the, the minting is being cut in half. They're gonna mint halves, which is driving the price up. And we will discuss whether there's a future for Bitcoin. And with all the things going on and with all the crises, um, I did a study on this about eight, seven years ago. I did a paper and I was asked in 2017 in November, uh, I was at one of the universities. And in my opinion, the blockchain technology is here to stay. Bitcoin is not a one-time wonder. There's a lot of use for that. It, it just needs a little more efficiency in the sense of understanding it. And um, 
to have the uniformity in some ways, but it is something that I think it definitely needs to uh, to be accepted. And it unfortunately it, it don't have a central vehicle. We don't have like an e exchange traded fund or fund. The good news is when I started it, it was very very difficult. You had to have a wallet. You had to. It was very difficult to purchase it. It has gotten much easier. So maybe in the next couple of weeks we will revisit this. And then I looked at the Bitcoin compared to gold and see where it was. We had this big drop in 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 Bitcoin. It has had a nice bounce, but now we are hitting the resistance at 559. So either gold has to move up or the Bitcoin will come down a little bit. Um, some people I talk to, it's like they say Bitcoin should be $100,000 today. But because of the lack of, there's a lot of things um, that uh, is not clear yet. Once it does, they, that's how they feel. And especially with the millennials, you know, with the social... Uh, pressure that there is. Uh, speaking of millennials, I just want to say, I know we get a lot of uh, thoughts, sometimes not too positive. Some of these millennials, they don't know what they're doing. But I tell you, millennials have gone through a lot. Uh, if you're a millennial, I mean, you've had, when they were younger, they had the internet bubble. Then they had a financial crisis. Now they have pandemics. I mean, we look at our grandparents and great grandparents, say, well, they had the Great Depression, they had World War II, but I tell you, this hasn't been fun last 20 years. So. Going outside the box, I like to look at there's always opportunities. And that's why you go to your FinVis, you look at your general, what you see, and then you, you look at this. This is rough rice. And look at the movement. I mean, from, Let's say it's October. You look at the stock market, what happened to stock market since October, look at what the rough price did. Um, my son owned a, he owned a, a Dubai company, I know, uh, in, uh, in March of last year and did pretty well. And after that, a lot happened. They were opening a company. They were selling their rice in Germany and then they just dove. I mean, last 10 days, it went up 100%. I mean, it's just, there are opportunities like that. So look for it. Another opportunity I've spoken before when we look at the long term is exchange traded fund the UGA. Last week we talked about oil, the crude oil, but that doesn't mean it has to affect everything else. I mean look at the rebob gas. I think I find some value in the gasoline. The way I see it, you know, with the airlines a lot of people are not going to be flying at least I don't know many people who are going to put their mask on and they're going to there's a sanitizer and then sit six feet apart. And I, I don't know. I don't know how many people start flying. So I feel that with the things just loosening up, there's going to be some more driving and the, the warmer weather is coming, the visitations. And the, I think you're going to see uh, more demand for the, the, the rebob gas and gasoline. This is an exchange traded fund, UGA. I had recommended it right around about 950. I still hold some of it. I've been selling like interesting about rebob gas or the UGA is it shoots up the first 10 minutes. It goes up like the 13 and then it closes, comes down middle of the day and then closes an average. So it is uh, it's just something to look for look at. All right, I'm going to go a little faster. Sorry, I got only 10 minutes, so I'm going to um, respect your time. So uh, next week, the weekly upcoming. As you know, last week was huge with the, <laughs> the, the thanks between the Apple and Amazon and Facebook and Google and Microsoft of the world. And it was really interesting what happened. And then Tesla of the world. And then the, Elon Musk thinks his Tesla, his dear Tesla is overvalued and asked the, the market to drop it down. And actually then the, the, the markets, uh, they said yes, they said thank you and they, they put the prices down. But it, usually the best earnings or the high earnings come in the beginning. The worst earnings are the bad, you know, things they come toward the end. We got two more weeks, but this week for instance, 
but sometimes the earnings are not good. They really pushed farther down the road. Um, I don't put too much value of the earnings that we are getting right now, because remember this whole thing, two, at least two months of this, two, two and a half months of these earnings were um, under normal circumstances. So that's why I'm not sure. That's why the emphasis on Q2 and Q3, those are gonna be more valid ones. And so far, nobody really wants us to, they don't wanna give us the guidance because they don't even know. I mean, look at what happened to Amazon. Amazon, which is again, its own world came out and said that uh, they had a great profits, but all the profits were spent on the maintenance and you know, on the, just to take care of the pandemic related. So we don't know, we don't know what numbers, so analysts don't know. I talked to some of the analysts, they don't know. Everything is a guessing game. Right now, everybody's thinking that quarter four is gonna be great and we're gonna come back the way we used to be. And that's what the market is pricing. I hope they are right. But based on my studies, I don't see it that way because of the, again, I'm looking at the average business owner, small business owners, some of them, a lot of people, small business owners that, that I know, they haven't gotten the, the SBA loans. I mean, they still don't. I mean, some of them have been accepted. Some of them is in process, but the money's still not there. There's quite a few businesses that already closed and shut down. I don't know what's going to happen to the rents. I don't know what's going to happen to the mortgages. We are in a better shape financially as far as the banks go, but the small businesses are the big part of it, about 15, 16% of this economy, and that's huge. So. Coming to the weekly earnings, next week we'll have Disney, CVS, Activision, Shopify, PayPal, Anheuser-Busch, and Uber. Uh, these are the ones that I chose. I thought they are the, they're the pretty good ones that to keep an eye on. Um, just a short story. I always have stories, so it's like Shopify. I mean, it's fantastic. They've done great. They are the part of the new technology, as you can see, they've done very well along with uh, other like uh, the clouds and security and then online digital uh, communications and healthcare. Um, I remember it, it was exactly three years ago and we was in a university competition for our students. We were in, in, in Seattle and uh, Shopify was the, there was a, uh, oh God, what was this? The, it, it came from a Canadian university, and that was their top. Well, they had to come up and analyze one company, and they put a big buy on this. And Shopify was at seventy-five dollars, and that was a great call. They, they felt it's going to go to hundred dollars, and you know we hit like six eighty or six sixty last week. So that was a wonderful call. It makes me proud of these students. Uh, it's just fantastic the way they do things. All right. Uh, financial term of the week. So this week, um, in a, every week, I like to have something that's applicable to your analysis. Last week, we talked about ATR, which was more of your management of your investment. The week before, we looked at the free cash flow, which is very important, I think, in these times. And I think return on equity is as valuable today as it's ever been, although it, it, it's Sometimes some of the numbers are not uh, as reliable, but at least it gives you the direction. And once you're learning, it's not just for today, I'm hoping you learn this for a long term so you understand why, um, what analysts look at or what portfolio managers look at. So return on equity is basically means the net income, which is that your bottom line profit, which is your total revenues, you take all the money you get, you take all the expenses, which includes the taxes, interest, and the expenses, and that becomes your net income, which is your income statements. The reason I chose this is also because net income is really, that's what the earnings, that's what the companies come up and say, well, this is what we did. That's how much money we made for that quarter or for annually, what we did. So you look at that, and then what is the shareholder's equity is, Remember, the companies usually, there's a few ways 
let's say I am a private company and I want to start to have this idea and I want to go big and there's different ways I can do financing. I could have my own money. I could be Mayor, Bo I mean, not ex -Mayor Bloomberg. I can have my own money and start my business. Or I could have investors say, come with me, private investors, and we can be, uh, you know, equity holders. We can basically be partners in a sense. But the two major ones, when you hear about the larger companies, when they go, they want to go public or they want to have the, they need a large amount of financing is either they have to borrow from the banks or they issue debt. And that's what the bond market comes into picture. They, they say, well, in exchange for this much return, we want to use your capital and we will pay it back in 10 years or five years. So that's the bond. But then a lot of companies, they want to go public and they issue shares and that's and you have shareholders. So everybody shares in the profits of that company. So what happens, any firm that any type of assets they have, remember they had debts, the liabilities goes up, then you have the shareholders equity. That's how much the shareholders have the right. And they are in this business to make money. So if I am buying, I invested in a company, I wanna make sure I, I'm gonna make profits because I have other opportunities. I could have put that money in the bank. So I, it's a, a cost of opportunity. So basically, they want to get good return on their money. And that's where the shareholder equity comes. And it's on your balance sheet. So basically, what happens is that the ROE shows how efficiently in this company is doing, especially as the management, that, many that the money that the shareholders that contributed and obviously the higher, the better. Now, this is important to know that I look for the companies that they have high rate of return, I mean, right, um, high uh, um, return on equity, but I also wanna make sure they don't have a lot of debt because sometimes the return comes because of usage of debt. So we will see like on Finviz, when you go and look at the companies and we will, one class we have to do just on screening, for instance, you want to make sure they have a low debt to equity and they have high return on equity. And this is really nice combination. So, so I hope this was useful. That's called return on equity. The technical indicator of the week, I want to make it short. These are called oscillators. They are really depending on the price of the underwriting stock. In this case, we talked about the stochastics. These are momentum indicators. They, actually show you how the price is moving and they allow you to look at a zone and see if the stock is overbought and turning down or the instrument or is it oversold and i'll show you a couple of i also use these stochastic oscillator for another reason which gives me a better understanding of where the market is and it's the divergence what that means is let's see your stochastic is coming down while the price is going up. So something is not right because we want harmony. If there's a momentum, you have this momentum pushing the stock price up, then it will continue. There's inertia and it will have the momentum. But if it, it isn't, then somebody's getting tired. And I use this example, I just give you like, there's a couple other examples. So I looked at XLF, remember the XLF, this is from the stock charts. We broke below the 50 day moving average. We visited one day, this is a failed breakout, we call it. This is a doji, it almost looks like an evening star. We went up, came back, we broke under. So there's not a lot of good news. On top of that, you can see, and I will show you in another um, uh, screen. First of all, we were over 80, we turned around, so there was a warning sign that we are going down below 80. So once you break below 80, then you go from overbought and that's a sell signal. And we call it here. We are in a lower, we turning down, we already in a, in a zone that, uh, let me go see exit. Oh. Okay, well let's look at this. So you can see we were up here and this is where, 
uh, stochastic was, we came to almost the same area, but look at where the stochastic is. We are much lower. That means the momentum has died. There's not enough oomph, as they call. There's not much push to bring the stock back up again. So because of this, the stock is here, and this went down, and this was a right around here, it gave, gave me heads up for XLF. And you notice I sold a little bit. So I did the same thing with the NASDAQ. You could see that the price we hit really the high of since this whole pandemic had started. You look at this, so the price is going up. This is my trend line. But stochastic actually didn't go. So you would feel if the price is going up, the stochastic has to push up because the momentum is there. And unfortunately it didn't. So this is a warning sign to me. So I use by the way, if you can use it yourself for short term, if you want, if you're a short term investor, we use eight day exponential. So I like the stocks, whatever I use to be above this eight day. And if it's selling, I want this to be below. So let's say it went up, it immediately turned back. It, it respected that. Every time it came and it kissed it, it went down. Then the turnaround was all of a sudden here, this is NASDAQ, went up, had a difficulty at the 20 day, came back, but then eventually just broke both of them and look what happened, it just continued. And look at the stochastics, they continued. So this is a warning sign to me. It's not a sell signal yet, because we still, as long as we're over 80, we're okay. Once we turn around and go from 80, under 80, then that will be a sell signal. And especially if you break under this 20 day moving average, then I will have sell signal. I did the same thing with S&P, SPX, and as you can see, we are going up, but the oscillator is going down. On the other hand, the opposite is here, look, that, that, that we were oversold because we were like really the momentum was really dying but something happened the price is going down but the momentum of selling is not going down so this is called divergence so this is higher than this while the price is lower and as soon as we broke our that oversold zone the 20 look what happened to the markets so I'm teaching you this because I want you to be able to use that in the future. So there's MACDs, there's RSI, but this is um, a good example of, of uh, I'm running a couple of minutes uh, over, so I apologize. The last but not least is the website of the week, basically uh, every week. And I hope you're using, some of these are really fantastic. So I try to make sure there's something that is useful like ETF.com, ETF, you can go and find all the gold ETFs or the miners ETFs and compare them and say, okay, GDX and GDXJ, what is the difference? Um, last week we talked about futures. This week, I think tons of information on the CBOE. It, it's a fantastic site, all about options. It's the Chicago Board of Exchange. It gives you anything you need. I know some of you would like to be, you know, have the initiative to it. Uh, but I will have a course basically talking about all kinds of options. There's about 72 strategies, but there's like main ones, like a 26 strategies you can use on options. But if you learn about five, five of them, you're golden. You can use that and have a, a good, you know, steady income without taking a lot of risk. So with that in mind, that's end of my presentation i'm gonna get if we see everyone all right and see in the chat if there's any any questions if not sean can you uh you can unmute yes uh, i'm going to unmute perfect okay great i'll uh i am good and uh rami Yes, best need you. Um, sorry, we talk last session we talked about five variables that we must deal with. Uh, the first one was uh, what are we trading? Mm -hmm. um, if I give you an example, as we talked about before, um, 
uh, I considered um, in cosmetic, beauty, or perfumes. Okay. Uh, uh, but I don't know how to discover in Finbiz or the okay. other. Okay. Uh, now, is this it? Well, it depends. You being in UK, it might be, I don't know if this is a British company or is it uh, international? Is it some um, company that is United States? Do you have a no, name? No, some of them is in France, uh, in okay. beauty, most of, most okay. of them. And some of them is in, from UK. Right, so Finviz is really mainly for international, and I mean you can look at um, in in the UK. Uh, there's uh, TD Ameritrade, for instance, and Schwab. They do have the UK. Uh, our Financial Times has it. Uh, but let's look at basically uh, the sector that you're, let's say, the industry that you're looking at, and then what we want to do. Uh, Let's go and look at the beauty um, uh, or cosmetics, maybe. Okay. Exactly. I searched this like you, but I didn't find it. Okay. Well, let me do this. So one of the ones that I've been watching, for instance, is maybe you should do this. So it's Ulta, right? So Ulta is specialty retail. Maybe that's what we need to do, specialty retail. So Ulta has, obviously it has gotten, got hit hard because, you know, when you're home, like for the last six weeks, you're not going to a parties. Well, obviously you're not using cosmetics. And if you come on Zoom, usually you don't want to, Maybe you want to put makeup on, some people don't. So that was one of the reasons. But there's a lot of other things that Ulta offers. And I think eventually that they're finding their niche. So uh, they probably then we should look at the specialty retailers. Because I don't use the Finvis for the, my screening, but it has a lot of good things. Mm -hmm. But um, that's probably would be the best way. So if I go to, again, if I go to screener. And then I look at industry and I go to specialty retailers. And then it also tells you what countries they are from. So, so let's say special retailer. And just mistake right there. Okay. So we have companies in China, in Mexico, UK, for instance, is uh, Artfish and Hudson. I don't know how. They are oh. Germany. So basically, that might be one way of doing a little research. So all you have to do is uh, let's do this. So you say, well, I want industry and I want it in, in the UK. And then you just uh, go to United Kingdom. And it gives you the, those two companies. So there's a Hudson and Farfetch. If you want to see it in France, then you just Again, these are just uh, just give you some ideas. So, mm -hmm. but there's nothing in France. So, so the UK, those are the, the two that you can study. Uh, uh, that's not what I, you know. There's again, you you have to do um, look at the macro economies. You have to have a story, and you have to have a reason why you think. Let's say, let's see what is. Let's see this. Which does, which is actually the chart looks actually not bad at all. I mean, it's it's a pretty good company. So yeah, actually, this is. And since we are here, let me just uh, take a look at. So um, it's a good example. Like I'm looking at the the good news is that there's not really much debt to equity, so that's a good sign. Uh -huh. But the return on equity hasn't been good. So when you see these reds operating at the, the, the margins, that means the operating profit margin is not good. Uh, basically earning per share, they've been losing money. So these are the things that you want to be watchful. So uh, they're specialty retailers. So there's, there's a big short interest. So that has been one of the reasons pushing up. But since I have you here, let's try something um, 
we are screening since everybody's oh everybody sees by the way do you see this uh yeah yeah, yeah. okay good i don't want to keep going with yeah, that can't see. <laughs> perfect so all you have to for screening all you do is you say well i want to go choose a company which is the return on equity is over 30 percent and then on the bottom i don't want a co any company i want to make sure like the debt to equity is under 0.2 immediately you have 86 companies out of 8,000, right but i also you don't want to have really small companies so you want to say that i want to make sure the price of the companies over ten dollars so that narrows down and then the other thing is the average volume i want to make sure they are liquid companies i don't want to uh, be in a company that doesn't have a lot of the, you know, the, the, a lot of volume because i want to make sure they're tradable so all of a sudden from all that i'm narrowed down to 15 companies and they are from ireland to canada to denmark there is different uh, services. That's one word of caution, by the way. So you want to make sure you compare ROE to the same sector. For instance, banking is completely different than, let's say, utilities. Even in the banking sector, you could have Bank of America, which is a commercial bank, has completely different ROE than, let's say, a regional bank. So. There's a lot, this is just the beginning. So here I know the, the companies like, uh, you know, Accenture is like in the information technology. So you can see, this is a, you narrowed everything down, but just using one little screen and then you can just pick and choose. Uh, electronic arts, because as you know, a lot of people who kids are at home playing games, it, it hit all time high. I mean. Look at that, a 52 weeks high while everything was going down. So uh -huh. that tells you. So this is the return on equity is at 43%. The debt is low. You can see this uh, return on assets is good. So something like that is it's a theme. So it's a <coughs> multimedia. But anyway, uh, I don't know. If, was that helpful, Neda? I don't want to confuse you. Yeah, please. but I was wondering because. Uh... I need to search about the industry or uh, search about the brands from which countries? Well, it all depends. I mean, this one, since you're in UK, I mean, you don't have to buy UK company. This is so, we are such a global economy now. Yeah. You can focus on China, you can focus on uh, United States, you can have companies who are in Germany. So don't, don't limit yourself just in UK. Um, mm -hmm. You could, it's just the amount of, what I'm trying to offer you is like, these are all free sites. So basically that's the reason. So these, all the companies are traded in the United States. So even if you open an account with the trade, TD Ameritrade, they will allow you to um, trade American stocks. And um, right now I would just emphasize the education part, just learn as much as possible about the companies mm -hmm. and how, yeah. and then do maybe a little, one, one thing I, I have to tell every one of you, please and just don't disregard this, it's important because I go back to my journal, please write your reasons, please write what happened, your emotional uh, state, when you were buying it, why you bought it, and that will give you why you sold it. Next week, I, I like to share a, like a money management and risk management skill. When do you sell something and why you have to, what you have to watch? Basically, and how many shares do you buy? Do you just randomly, you say, oh, I got 10,000, I'm gonna buy a thousand shares of this. So I will show you that because of the time. I, uh, this week we had a lot to go over, so I will do it next week. But right now, I wanna make sure even if it's, it's a theory, you know, it's like a dummy account or just sit down and write. And then a week later, come and analyze that. Now, if one thing is you can also sign up for, for you know, there's a registration and you can actually have a portfolio. You can actually do, uh, so choose some stocks and assume you bought them that day. 
and then based on that, see, watch it every day because then it tells you how, you know, how much you made on it, what is the latest news on them. So it, this is a good little tool if you register with FinViz, not paying. Um, well, since you, you brought me to this, one of the interesting uh, exchange traded funds is Cal. I used to play that a lot. So rather than playing futures, you can, the Cal is uh, the exchange traded fund for livestock and you know what's happening with livestock. I'm becoming to some resistance, but uh, uh, that has done okay. You know, last week was up 12%, which is what happened to the hogs, pigs, and, and cattle and chickens. So anyway, um, but I, I will talk to you in private, Neda. If you, you like, we can talk more. Uh, yeah, that's 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 well, I, I appreciate uh, Neda's question on the screener because I love to use it, but I don't really get know enough to get good results. And what I don't know if there is any rule about which are your favorite um, screeners to use. I'm sure it depends on your goals, but uh, I, I try to like use RSI. And I'm not sure if that's even important, but I try to use it and then I get nothing I recognize. No, <laughs> no, good. No, I appreciate that. So I think what we should do, uh, these are great questions because that gives me a theme that we will, again, I love to do like the whole just section and just on thin visit because there's so many things to do, but the screening is an art. And if you notice what I've done last, three weeks, for instance, is that's what I tried like to show you what are important ones, like return on equity. I want to see the price to cash flow, which is, you know, price to free cash flow. So these are the teams that you want to go with the companies that they have earnings. So maybe I can come up with, depending on whether you're a value or growth investor, that you will, you will learn that, uh, what are the priorities and each economy has its own really screening. So uh, this, I think that will be helpful. I, I, so basically I just give you one rule of thumb, especially if you wanna be in liquid. I want, I, I try to invest in companies who have the option, they're optionable. Um, so that, that, there's, there's one I like to, make sure the price is over $10. I wanna make sure that, that, that the volume is high. So right there, you eliminate maybe 90%. Or what you could do, the other thing is you can say, well, I want a reputable company. I just wanna look at companies in S&P 500. And for me, for instance, I wanna make sure the companies that they have, uh, uh, let's say, what is the best return on equity? So you press on return on equity, and it tells you what are the top companies in S&P 500, which they're definitely the largest and they're the liquid, and they have the best return on their equity. So it gives you that. And also tells you what is the debt to equity is. So right off bat, you know, I mean, you look at CTXS, which is the you know, go-to meeting and the Citrix. So right off bat, you can, you can, kind of choose few of them and they're mostly well-known companies so but we will do one session on that Chris and I, I, I agree because there's just so much I mean there are companies like Zacks and there are companies that I mean IBD has its own screening um, but there's a lot of ways but I, I the reason I like Finviz is because it's so much under one roof that it allows you to uh, move from one screen to another and have a big picture rather than just a specific, but maybe that will be something next week. I'll uh, I'll come up with maybe a a site with, for the best screening, for instance. Uh, Ramin, do you I know, would love that. Yeah, Thank do you. you know the number there? Um, for example, the ROE. Uh, yes. Is that for the recent quarterly number, or is that for the yeah you, know, uh, you know future number? Uh, I don't know. Good questions. No, I, unfortunately, they do not. Uh, and again, these are not, these are based on the, the previous. So in order to do that, it, it is, so you just click, uh, I don't, you can see my uh, uh, 
uh, my cursor. It says return on equity and it says TTM. What that TTM stands for is trailing 12 months. So for the past 12 months, so it's in the past. So it doesn't, so do you have to do a little more research on your own? Look at the projection of the sales and, and that's where the difficulty comes, right? And that's what I like technical analysis, looking at charts. But I like to start fundamentally and then I look at what is the big institutions are doing, for instance. So, so basically return, this is a, again, trailing 12 months and that's for the past. So then what you could do, you basically know what is the equity is and then make your own projection for what it will be this quarter, for instance, for the net income, because net income is really the earnings. And um, again, it's gonna be a little difficult, but I just wanted to share something that, uh, for instance, I think inside the transactions are a big thing for next one month or two months, you wanna see, are they, like when it, these earnings come and then you want to see what is the management doing. I shared this uh, uh, before. So I was like, it was really interesting for me. I've been watching, but like MGM, right? So I look at MGM, got hit. I mean, this is leisure and you know, hotels. And then I go down and I, I see, Look at how many buys we've had on April 9th. April 9th, we've had the president. I don't give much value to the directors, but I like to see different kinds of directors. And then that, and I wanna see different names. So there's one, two, then I have the CFO, which is very important to me. So in March 31st, bought at $12 and eight cents. So I like to see the variety of things especially there were some sales. And then I like to see, uh, again, I don't like one director coming and keep buying, but when I see the variety of things, that gives me a little confidence to see what's the story, what is going on. Um, so I put it on my list to just watch it. And then one of the screens that you could do is say, look at the inside the transactions and see for the last six months in this, you know, has there been more toward the, buy side and next time in screen, that means like 451% increase in buying activity. So just a food for thought and you can do it going through screening or you can actually just go to the insiders and just go, you just say buy transactions and boom, it gives you the, like as of even May 1st, you know, so-and-so bought, you know, this two people have been buying in this Sterling Bank Corp, for instance. You wanna have larger shares and you wanna know why, and, uh, and especially if they're new, if there has been not many activities in the past two years, those are good stuff. That's another thing we can do, I mean, um, insider, because I think it's valuable to see in the next few months who is buying and who's believing in their own company, especially you're not gonna see a lot of buybacks uh, for many reasons, so anyway. Okay, I don't know if that was helpful. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. I mean, just really quick. Uh, yes, Henry. Yes, I could probably look it up myself, but what's the difference between slow cash ticks and fast cash ticks? And which Good one? question. Yeah, so basically with the slow, they go back 14 days and then they, they average, they look, it's mainly, either looking back and using uh, a moving average of past three days or the 14 days. We as analysts, I mean, I, as a trader, we favored slow, because the three could be a lot of noise in it. So I, I recommend, unless you do like a really day trading and you are in and out, if not, uh, Basically, it's a good idea. Just use the slow stochastics, which goes to 14 bars. Okay. Yeah. Good question, actually. Okay. Uh, yeah, we got about five, six minutes. So. I mean, how is yeah? How is the how is the uh, premium on an option um, calculated? Is it a standard percentage, or is it based on? The day is it is it a long formula or something like that? It, it excellent question, Mark. That's why we have to have just a class on that. So the premium is a really dynamics in a sense, but there's like the major there's like a um, um, 
major things which affects it. Obviously, one of them is, is what exercise price you want. So if, you, let's say the stock is at 100 and you want to buy $150, what is the probability? So they look at the, the, the so the option uh, market makers, they want to keep the money. So they're going to give you what they think is the odds are in their favor, like a casino, right? So the premium, there's a black skulls formula. So it, it, it is a pretty confusing, but it depends on the interest rate, which means nothing today. Main things is the time. So obviously the more time you have, the odds are in your favor, right? So if I'm betting something's going to go from 10 to 11, if it's next week, the odds are really not much in my favor. But if it's like three months from now, the odds are in your favor. So there's a time element. So that's one thing. So the longer the time, the higher the premium. So there's a positive relationship. The number two is basically the volatility of the stock. Now, you can have, um, used to be like Procter Gamble or even Walmart, even Microsoft used to be, you knew they're pretty steady companies. So there's they call, something called, we use a standard deviation, for instance. So it was kind of an easy smoothing. So you were, it was predictability there. But let's say you have a biotech company which is, let's say they're coming with a vaccine for a cure for cancer. One day they're up, one day they're down. Because of that volatility, then you know, again, as an option writer, you know, market maker, I'm looking at, mate, listen, the odds are not in my favor because any time you can hit the number that you're betting on. So that's number two. So the time, the volatility. And the third one is the exercise or the option price or the I mean, that strike price that you're looking at. I mentioned the house is 500,000, but mm -hmm. let's say if I said 600, it's like something, let's say you're buying a stock is 100, but you're betting it's gonna be 102, the odds of you making that 102 is much higher than 110. So because of that, then you have to pay higher premium. So those are the th three main things. There's two other factors which really don't come into picture much, but well, one of them another because interest rates. Because when there's an interest rate, that premium, if you're you can use that money and go put it somewhere else and earn interest, let's say five percent, but then you should pay higher premium. So there's a cost of, but right now with everything being zero, it doesn't play any role. The fifth one is the dividends. With the dividends, if the stock is paying a dividend then really it reduces the option price. So those are the five factors, but the three main ones are how much time you have, how much volatility you have, and how much out of or in the money you are. I mean, what is your bet? If the stock mm -hmm. is at 100 and you say, I want the $90 one, you're basically, you know, you're pretty in a good chance that you're gonna hit that $90 because you're already 100. So you have to pay a lot higher premium for that. And if something you're betting, it's going to go 150, for instance. Thank you. And, and you always lose the premium, no matter what, Ramin? Good. Yeah. So basically, the premium is your uh, good faith that you now that premium could go up. So then you just take your profit. But if you don't and it expires, that you, you just basically um, you have to just uh, resign to the idea that that was a good gamble and I, I, I made it. So the premium is not, the premium is the insurance company or casinos to kick. All right. So that's what there's a good, I mentioned about income strategies. More people do better as the user spreads or as an option writer because they know 90%, 95% of the time they will keep that money. So I'd rather be the insurance company than being the auto race driver. So that's why, because most of the time they do keep the premium. So, yeah. Ramin Hamad here, can I ask oh, a question? Sure. 
yeah, I wanted to uh, want to, wanted your opinion that you know it seems that uh, some of these large tech companies, like you were saying, they seem to be living in their own world despite all this crisis. I mean, if you look at year to dates for some of them, I mean, either they have recovered or they are you know ten twenty percent positive, as yes. opposed to majority of the market, which is you know struggling twenty thirty forty percent depending upon what industry you're on. Correct. Do you think that this tra- is just uh, a temporary thing or now that all the earnings are out and you know we know where things are sitting this trend is going to continue into next quarter as well that's a very good question and that's what i think this is a good time to separate and we are in the two markets really so um i mean something like microsoft i've analyzed their numbers i mean but they, I, they had a strong with the icloud and they've really diversified so basically you have to sit back and say even if today, for instance, they found that everybody's back to work. So you have to keep, you have to come up with scenarios. So as a portfolio manager, what I do is I look at one scenario with the worst case scenario, right? So I give it 20% chance and I say 30%, maybe by July, August, things are going to be smoothing and or uh, basically let's say the best thing will be we got this cure everybody's back to work next month so you give them probabilities and then you say okay here's microsoft a year from now will it be in business or not because microsoft is a good example compared to let's say disney right so disney which was a, a darling of all the you know a lot of investors the children and now we have to look back are we going to go to the park what is happening with the movie theaters what is happening with the um as far as let's say their Netflix competitors. So it's a completely different world because if we had another wave coming, let's say in fall, and that they have cruise liners. So that gives a completely different picture than let's say something like Amazon or Microsoft I use. Microsoft, regardless of what happens, still has the revenue stream coming. So, uh, that's what you have to look at from the story point of view. And that's why you look at their internals and look at uh, the guidance is very difficult, but again, they had a good guidance. Uh, and then uh, basically you look at the valuation. So if that's a good valuation, how are they doing with their dividends? Are they going to continue? What is their profit margin? What their sales tendency? So, yeah. So, but I think the companies which were strong, they might be one-time wonders, like say it was like a, there was this biotech company it just came up with this great news and then it fizzled out. That's different than a large company. And, and I think biotech is actually a good sector to look at, a uh, good industry actually, uh, you know, would be something, there's a lot going on with biotech. And so they are kind of independent of the economy. So. That's what you want to emphasize. And we talk about digital. We talk about last time we talked about themes, it, like uh, uh, Internet of Things. It, we look at the security, you know, Internet usage. So you think back and you say, okay, when the kids go back to school, will this Internet or the clouds or are they still going to be using? So those are the things. So I think, yes, some of these companies, there are reasons but also because the money wants to find the most secure institutions. Um, they have so much money that sometimes they can't buy the small cap, so they kind of emphasize working on, uh, on the large companies. One, I'm glad you asked. One last thing I have to say. If you notice, the, the whole thing happened on April 30th, which is, we call it end of the quarter. Dressing. So with, with the window dressing, what happens is, you know, it was a great month. So there was some profit taking on, on, on April 30th. So basically you want to make sure that uh, you, uh, you, you also think about the time of the month when you're investing. So um, I don't know if I was clear, Hamad, but yes, you're on the right track. So there are, there's a reason you follow the money basically. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Of course. All right. It's a little past four o'clock. I don't want to hold you.
Okay, so I really appreciate your time. I hope this is beneficial. Again, my mission is to make you independent and uh, hopefully uh, uh, create interest too, because it is fascinating and uh, I really enjoy it. So as you can see, but uh, I, uh, I'll, uh, I hope to see everyone uh, next week. And uh, again, Sean, I wanna thank you for all your help and thank you for sending all the recording and then we do this slide. So I hope you go back sometimes and look at the slides. Hopefully they kind of start the conversation at least. So, all right. Thank you very much. I know it's a little Thank after you. four o'clock. Thank so you. I, Have a good day. I wish you a great week, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.